It's livening. Well, Brian, if they don't know that you're raising them in your backyard, I don't think you really have to worry about the Department yeah. of Wildlife. Yeah. <laughs> it's just feeding them. I just can't imagine how much food that takes. Oh, you my know, gosh. Particularly a breeding pair. Uh, my uh, 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 Sasquatches, they don't come cheap, do they? Yeah, Sasquatches. <laughs> uh, children. <laughs> All right. I guess we could just jump right in. I'm sure the audience will come, come, uh, I guess. Yeah. Do we want to wait for people or just go? Let's just go. All right. Then, uh, Andrew, you could take us in, in three, two. Hello and welcome to the weird things podcast. I'm Andrew Mean, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello. Hello. And Justin Robert Young. That's me. So, gentlemen, uh, this week's been an interesting uh, week for technology and AI in particular, which is, I should just have a button to press that and have it say that every time. Yeah. <laughs> and in particular, we had uh, several things come out. Um, uh, previously, like, I think we before, I don't know if we covered it much, but like Facebook had updated their Llama to like 3.2, uh, their newest versions of Llama models. And I think we talked about maybe like they have a Llama 1B, you know, 1 billion parameter model, tiny enough to fit on top of, you know, fit in your phone, which is actually kind of a cool model. This week, we had OpenAI had a series of announcements. Um, a couple of them are pretty cool, and we'll get to what Meta announced this week, too, which is also pretty awesome. But uh, OpenAI had their Dev Day. And Dev Day is now, this was their second Dev Day, which is basically they invite developers to come to, in this case, a very sweaty location in San Francisco and see some of the latest announcements for the developer community. And they showcased off some very cool stuff. Um, particular, uh, they have a thing that's called the, the real-time API. And what this is, is basically the ability to when you want to do, let's say, when you're talking to voice mode and you're talking to chat GPT and the, the new advanced mode, uh, which we, you know, have all had and loved and playing with for years now. Hey. Um, what it does, <laughs> what it does is it creates this connection so that when you're speaking to the AI, you can do, do this nonstop conversation. So now they've availed, a, they've created an API that lets you, anybody who wants to build an app on top of it can do that and have that, that same conversation back and forth, whether it be text or audio, which is you know, extremely engaging. And you can put that in apps. It's a little pricey, you know, I think the real-time API when you're talking to like what it costs per minute, but if you're trying to do like customer support or phone ordering, oh yeah, that's cool. They did a demo, which was kind of their version of the Google demo years ago where they had some had their AI agent call up like a restaurant and ask for details. Here it goes on, the, the call starts and says, hey, I'm an AI voice assistant for so-and-so, I'd like to place an order. And they placed the order to somebody standing on stage and basically said, hey, I wanna order a bunch of chocolate covered strawberries and you know, I and negotiated. It's like, it knew the budget it had, it knew the address and whatever. And so that was kind of a pretty cool thing because you're able to see this voice assistant have a font conversation with somebody over the phone. Uh, is, is it worth looking at that clip? Uh, what should I search for? Um, I don't know if the clip is there. Okay. I don't know if it's up yet. Yeah. This I don't know if just, they... Yeah, this is, this was, this is Maine giving us a, a on the ground reporting. Well, so, so if it's expensive, I can understand why. And, and, you know, we've had conversations about, well, what does it mean for this to, let's say, replace somebody's job that would otherwise pick up the phone? I think that we have seen, at least in our modern world, that there are far fewer customer service representatives that we feel would be good enough that would actually solve our problem. And so if we can augment it with this technology, it would be fantastic as long as it can actually do things that we want it to do. And and if it's either on the calling end or the receiving end, uh, uh, you know, look, it, either if I can tell my AI assistant that uh, uh, please solve this problem for me, so I don't have to be sitting in a chat window all day and, and it knows and understands what solution needs to come back and can ping me when it's done, that's great. Or on the other hand, if I'm talking to a voice assistant, but I can actually make requests that 
get done in in a in a timely manner, boy, I would love it. I I I, I would love for. Uh, I, for one, welcome our robot overlords right, the world, right, right, right. world of customer and service. Totally unironically and full-throatedly. I mean, it, it, like, the fact that I have to, uh, like, jailbreak a CSR when I call Spectrum, the fact that they won't actually listen to me until the 45-minute mark, the fact that this is an autonomous human being who's living a, a life where they have to make decisions out in the real world, but they are placed within a rigid structure in which you could tell she had to stick to the script, even though mm -hmm. she knew that this was dumb. And we both had to do this stupid Kabuki play. And it's, we had to get past that 45 minute mark before finally real action was taken. It's, it's like a video game that you have to start at level one every effing time. And then you get all the way up to, Oh, finally we're at new territory where maybe we'll actually get somebody to fix this. Yeah, when it, whenever you're really in it, like Brian is right now working with Spectrum because there's a problems with the internet to his HQ, it, it just is like the most frustrating part is wherever you leave issues, when you have to call back to move the ball forward again, is just like, you know, it, it's like trying to talk to Drew Barrymore in 50 First Dates. Like they've just <laughs> totally forgotten everything that's happened. And it, you, just, you know, they're like, no, look, look, check your records, check your records. I have already called in. I talked to Doug and then I talked to Evan and then Evan gave me to Brian. So please, can you just get me back to that person or an equivalent now? And they're like, <laughs> well, would you like to subscribe to Cinemax? No, I'm not that uh, 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 in, 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 in Vartado Delecto. Please get, get me to where I need to be. <laughs> and at least in a movie like uh, Edge of Tomorrow, there was the secret code word of which middle name she claimed to have that would that would be a proxy. It was like a save game point. About like, okay, I could trust you this amount immediately. Yeah. So what's interesting too is like they came out with it and I, like I said, I think it bit it a little bit of a pricey end, but also, you know, you have a, a technology, everybody, people have talked about this forever and people want uh, deep gram, which I think they've got really good speech to text and sex to speech technology. Literally a day later, they unveiled the deep gram uh, voice agent API, which is going to be their version of that. And we're going to see, a, am sure we're going to see a Google product. We're going to see a lot of other people coming out with like similar sorts of things. And as you said, that part of what's interesting is when you take a really smart system like a GPT-40, or you know, if you can figure out a fast O1, that can negotiate and can kind of like, you know, you think about that where, because the thing we've talked about, like in a, a fun idea I'd love to explore at some point would be, you know, literally a startup that just literally has your AI negotiate and it negotiates with somebody else's AI and knows what you want, what you don't want, and thinks of new things to get out of that. That's the world we get into. And, you know, I've, We've talked before, I think we mentioned before, there was a paper that came out that was really about how to, how to manipulate people, but they put it under, you know, how to how to convince people of falsehoods or whatever and conspiracy theories or how to talk them out of it. It was really, you know, how to super manipulation. And that's the thing that we worry about when you know, we talk about like real concerns with AI. Super manipulation is actually a thing because when you have the most persuasive AI on the planet, you don't want to walk into that naked and but i think that's where you know i'm like yeah i'm gonna have my ai lawyer or my ai negotiator go in and i've, I've said this to people like what are you gonna do when we reach like super superhuman persuasiveness it's like what i have virus defense on my computer i have i have we've had human expenses you know we have police forces we have lawyers we have all these other things to protect us from other organized intelligences and why would it be different? Well, and and of yeah. course, the immediate response from some people will be like, oh, so you could just have a, a gatekeeper that prevents you from ever learning the truth or like uh, they'll wrap themselves in a bubble. But I don't believe that's the case. I believe that once it's an option, like from selected presets, you know, would you like your AI information gatekeeper to only provide facts that confirm all of your theses, or would you like a balanced diet of information? And it's like uh, people are likely to select that stuff. Uh, you know, again, there are questions of trust, whether or not we trust this entity, uh, et cetera. But I feel like everybody likes to believe that they have a healthy, balanced diet of information that they're taking in uh, and that they'll select that option if it's available. 
Yeah, I mean, it's a cult or for you if you don't want to. And I think that, you know, me, I might just give an AI my power of attorney, you know, so that, you know, yeah. I might be talked into anything like, ah, yeah, I want to, I want to cybernetically enhance whales. You know, it sounds great. I could give you my Wait whole money. This is the minute. greatest idea ever. <laughs> So they, they announced that some other features they have, their vision API, which is their ability for the GPT-4 to look at stuff, you can now fine tune it. Big limitation there is it can't do anything with faces. I tried to run a thing with some like some illustrations and stuff I had. It's like, nope. So uh, I think the challenge they have is they have some amazing technology, but they have much firmer rules or things they're trying to do for guidelines for what they think is safe or whatnot. I would argue as a guy outside OpenAI, not currently working at OpenAI that I think sometimes these things are literally two years behind the times because you know, I had yeah. a conversation like, well, you know, there's some practices. I'm like, literally I can do an open source model that's, you know, going to be good for most purposes and don't have to worry about any of that. Like we're not, we're not protecting anything. You know? Yeah. Um, but that, you know, that those things are available. Prompt caching, which is interesting thing. So what this means is let's say, you know, Brian, you create like, you know, Brian's, you know, uh, marketing, wizard you know uh growth bot whatever ai and you have a really long prompt that you have to put in there that's like three thousand tokens each time mm -hmm. so what prompt caching does another company's office this thing google's done this too whatever is that basically because if you keep hitting the api with that over and over again and there's a certain cost to each time you put in a bunch of context if it's if it's cached if it's kept in memory it lowers the cost so now what happens is they've reduced that by like 50 percent. so if you keep sending the same prompt back to it you only pay half as much for your input tokens which is kind of really cool because it give you an example of what that means from just the sheer economics of where we've been about with with pricing and stuff on stuff where historically we talked about when gpt3 came out it was six cents per thousand tokens now GPT-40 for input tokens is uh, if you do GPT-40 mini, it's it's 15 cents per million input tokens. If you're using prompt caching, basically if if most of your prompt is the same prompt, you're at, at 0 0.075 cents per million tokens. Yeah. So that's like an inc yeah incredible saving, well, and, and that works too. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, oh, I was going to ask. Uh, I I assume also what one thing I've noticed. Be when you go back to zero and you try to train it up for, uh, let's say, a complex task, you don't want it. You you don't you can't just begin with your wish. You have to do all the throat clearing to get there. But I've noticed even if you say the same things in the throat clearing to get it up to the point where it's ready to do the task, because randomization is baked in at a core level, you, you get you get different results sometimes. Like sometimes the spell works, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, temperature can affect that. There are a couple of factors for that. But you think about this, where like I have uh, for my app that I'm working on with my wife, Channel 3, which is this thing for helping to do like image design and layout for that. I send these conversations back in. And so these conversations like, hey, we did this, we did this, we did this. These might be 4,000, 5,000 tokens. And so it's automatic. And the new request might literally be a sentence that says, make it bigger. So what's great is that just reduced my cost by half. Yeah, for doing yeah. that. And, and I can either say I'm going to provide more context or whatever. And again, other companies have offered this, but it's nice to see OpenAI do it. They then had a, kind of a really cool feature, which it, it's going to sound a little technical at first, but really, if you, you can know, you know, you can what we do call fine tune your own version of GPT-4. And what that means is I can take a bunch of data now, like conversation data of like, this is how I answer questions. This is a format take 30 or 40 examples and train a model to learn on that. And then the next time you just ask the model of how to answer it. So fine tuning has become pretty simple. You can do it from the dashboard. I can show just about anybody how to fine tune their own custom model now. And it's, you know, it's extremely cheap. Right now it's free to fine tune a model. And the problem is getting that data. You know, where do you get that data from? So let's say we take, you know, Brian Brushwood's growth wizard app and he has, you know, thousands and thousands of conversations that have been you know answering these questions and answering them brian can go through and say this was great not so great this is great but he can take that data inside the dashboard and say i want to train a gpd 40 model or gpd 40 mini model what we call distill it down so take the bigger model take those conversations and then distill it and train a much smaller cheaper model based upon that uh that's pretty great the uh uh i i, I question and and uh, I don't know if you know or not. Uh, 
does 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 when I create a new instance uh, talking to ChatGPT, does it know every other question I've asked on every other thing, and is that feeding into the model as I talk to it each new question? No, the only way that'll do that, if you look inside ChatGPT, you'll see a thing called memory. Mm -hmm. And every now and then you might say, uh, see a thing called updating memory. And you can go adjust, you can edit the memory, you can wipe that. So every now and then it might grab a thing. If you say, oh, I'm Brian Brushwood, you know, I live at such and such drive, whatever. There's a little agent in there that goes, oh, this might be useful later on. Let me add it to memory. So if you look inside ChatGPT in your settings, you can see memory. That's the only kind of persistent data that it has from one conversation to the next. Okay. And and that yeah, is the something the you could say when I, forget when I everything. asked it to when I asked it to tell me what it knew about me, it turns out that it was storing everything that I told it about uh, Ashley's pregnancy and now our child. It was very very it, it it remembered all of anything that I had asked about that. Yeah, so if you want to see go into click on your name, you know, go to settings, go to personalization, and but, then you'll see memory, and there's memory on or off, and then you can see it shows you. And then you can click on manage memory, man. I'm and it I'm, can show you. I'm trying to find even my name on this. Uh, uh, Which oh, are top, you in top, the top Mac, right corner? Top right corner. The Mac app yeah. or the browser? Oh, uh, just in the browser. Oh, top right, the picture of me that uh, yeah, got yeah, it. Yeah. Okay, got it. So settings. Yep. <laughs> I think it, it remembered that my trash can is 38 gallons. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. So and then where where in here? Go to settings, personalization, yep. settings, and then you see memory, personalization, and then okay. manage. This is awesome. This is the part where I take it off screen because I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, look. Uh, so some of the things uh, I'm going to read it. Uh, for, Brian wants to understand the process of conflagration in wooden matches. Brian is setting up a new computer on a local area network and needs to find and connect to a disk station unit using Windows 11. Brian is using OBS on Windows 11. Brian is using CapCut Desktop for video editing as a project to open on his mobile phone. He's trying to figure out how cloud computing works within CapCut to access his project on the desktop app. Brian is checking the spaces section, but only sees media, not projects. He's having difficulty. So Brian is dumb. But, uh, uh, and then Brian before, is learning. Yeah, Brian he, is learning. <laughs> exactly. Uh, oh, man, it definitely learned that uh, I'm involved with the Wizard of Ads partner. It knows that I have a MailChimp account. Um uh, bro, <laughs> this is funny. I did this as a hypothetical, but it wrote it as fact. Brian has a friend named Jake who sometimes explains things using references that Brian doesn't get. <laughs> <laughs> Brian wants to write a song for Bonnie Brushwood. <laughs> uh, that's crazy. All right. Uh, uh, so, yeah, for those of you who know, if you have ChatGPT+, whatever, you can go on. You know, have a very good understanding of you, but you have full control over it. You know, that's what you really want. And I've I've had it where I did a demo for my wife's sister, or she's my wife's uh, a friend of hers, and she and it thought my name was Tonvi, that I was this Bollywood actress, which was you know adorable. And I had to go in and say, no, that's that's you know delete it. So uh, they've unveiled that, which is pretty cool. Uh, another feature that they've had again, I think that I think the the fine tuning is going to be great because the way they did it, it's just super super easy. Because every time if you build an app, every time you have a message, you can just save that in for thirty days and then go in there and select those that entire thing. So if you're using a bigger model, you just use those examples. Small factor of ten. Open AI and very. the approach of the cheaper and easier it is to deploy the more places will deploy you know you saw the latest numbers wall street journal talking about you know opening eyes making like 300 million dollars a month they just closed their new valuation around at 155 billion and um i obviously i'm a fan and friends with everybody there but uh i think it's a big big space there's going to be a lot of winners and i'll talk about some of the cool stuff Meta's has done in a second but uh, a thing they just announced they just showed that's now available Brian, are you in ChatGPT right now? I am. I'm still uh, questioning my life decisions with what I've shared with ChatGPT. <laughs> I want you to go do, let's do a new thing. Go open up. Oh, hold, hold on one sec. I'm sorry. Uh, 
It looks like we're having severe internet hiccups. I was besmirching. Mm-hmm. I was besmirching Spectrum, and now a most curious stopping and starting is happening of my internet. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, wait, wait, uh, what we have? If, if you could just bring us in, I think I can edit edit the uh, some, uh, some of the, your last point got real chopped up, um, but. If it's going to keep going, I can do this as a pickup point. And you said, you were saying, here's another thing. Um, yeah, do I have ChatGPT yep. open? Yeah. So if you have ChatGPT open right now, go to the top where you can select the model. Select Ch- ChatGPT 4.0 with Canvas. Okay. Uh, with Canvas. All right. And that's in beta. Got it. Okay. Now put in, type in, I want you to create a business plan for a podcast empire for robots. Okay. Uh, you know what? Uh, uh, I want want you to create a business plan for a And you can pod- close your sidebar if you want. To, oh, I mean, I don't think there's much in there. You can tell <laughs> I'm I'm learning how to use different things. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> uh Empire run by robots? Four robots, let's oh, say. Oh, four robots. Whatever. It doesn't matter. It's just just the empire. Okay, so oh, got it. So Ooh, this is neat. So to, so for our audio listeners, which is everybody, uh, they <laughs> added a feature called Canvas, which is, you know, um, Claude has artifacts, which is a cool way to sort of build mini apps and do sort of stuff. Open the eyes answer to that is called Canvas. And what it does is, let's say you're working on a text document and you want to keep iterating on it. It puts over into the right section of the screen. And if you notice though, Brian, if you go highlight, areas of text you can edit it uh, and of, of their text you, oh yeah or just just bring your curse bring your your mouse over it yeah uh products and go over and to services. the right got it okay go over to the right bring your mouse over to the right you see that little button the little plus yep yep so you can click on that and you can add us to add ask it to explain edit oh. or do something if you go down to the bottom to the little tip the 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 suggest there's a little cursor at the very bottom where you can like a pencil and you can adjust the length, you can adjust the reading level, you can add final polish, you can add emojis. Uh oh, oh, got it. So so this is taking its own output and and whatever I type is going to be edited. Well, yeah, if you if you go look at the bottom right corner of the screen, which uh, we can't see here. The suggest edits, got it? Yes. I can uh here we go. Let's put that there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, suggest edits and it's got uh, add emojis, add final. Yeah, if you un- unhighlight the whole thing, if you unhighlight what you highlighted uh-huh. and just let it do the whole thing. If you go down to there again and click on adjust reading level, for example, etc. Oh, so let's make it kindergarten. And so right now it's rewriting everything very quickly too, and it's like the plan is to make a bunch of fun shows for robots. And now. If I hit stop and I change the writing level to uh, graduate school, the exact same thing. This business plan outlines the conceptualization and execution strategy for developing a podcast network specifically designed for robotic. This just makes me hate fancy grown-up talk. Yes. (laughs) That's crazy. So uh, you can do a lot of different kind of capabilities here. And let me see if I can show an example of something here. Um, I'm going to pull up um, something from a book, and I'm going to try a new one here. So what's nice is that it gives you the ability to kind of fine-tune what you're working on in a different environment than what perhaps you've, you've you know, than just the back and forth, because not everything fits. We've talked... You know, we've talked a lot about how, uh, you know, chat may not be the most ideal way in which to have to, you know, try to work on something. And so if you can put things into a different modality, then all of a sudden you have different capabilities. Okay. Um, And I'm going to pull up a thing. I'm going to just import a, a lot of text here. And... uh, Let's... I added some text in here. I'm going to try... uh create a new document and edit. 
So if you paste in, let's say you're already something you're already working on from the document, you can paste it in and say, let's create a new document and edit it. And so like I had a thing, a, a summary of the time machine and I paste it in there and then it popped that in the window. So it's not just for text that you create in ChatGPT, you can add your other existing text to it and create a document for it. That's fascinating. I, I saw a lot of the conversation around this was that it was the answer to uh, the <clears throat> anthropic feature uh, artifacts, uh, but, yeah. but it seems like this is that plus a, a little bit more in terms of the textual side of it, because artifacts seem to be mostly a coding uh, thing. Well, yeah, artifacts can do, will do like pop out document stuff. And, and artifacts is great for like creating a little code and artifacts will run code. Artifacts will run code, yeah. put it on a, in a, an environment for you. Um, Artifex is very useful. I think that what OpenAI thought was they looked at like their business users. I think that what they looked at is said, okay, there are they have a you know a huge part of OpenAI's customer base is enterprise users, and certainly they have amazing tools for. And you can actually code inside of here too, but you won't it won't create like spin out apps like art. It's actually, yeah. I would say the code here is actually more useful if you're actually a coder than maybe Artifex is. Artifacts is great if you're just a regular person that just wants to make stuff. And I think I think that's fantastic. So they said for two things open I wanted to focus on was people got to work in documents, which is most knowledge workers. And then if you want to do code, it will pop it up into a code editor and let you spin on it out. And so I mean it's it's we're in this awesome time, you know, you know, where both these companies and Google too, they're all and Microsoft, they're all working and competing and just creating amazing features that we get to benefit from. And it's kind of like the, you know, iPhone versus Android, yeah. where it just kind of continues to get like really, really cool. So um, well, uh, you know, anyhow, I, I think that's I, I had the thought, Andrew, that that the last time I felt this way about just a scene in general was I mean, first of all, there's that moment when we all got the internet and all of a sudden a new world opened to us. But then there was a second wave of it when Google showed up. All of a sudden, the internet just felt so much bigger because we could find more of what we wanted. Uh, and then, but nowadays, you know, when, when you Google something, you get a bunch of ads and the same five articles under SEO optimized keywords. And you have to work too hard to find anything that's not being intentionally placed in front of you. Whereas now we're back to an age where happy accidents and mistakes can happen and you find yourself in intellectually fascinating corners. And um, uh, I don't know, I'm really excited about it. Yeah, so like uh, I added a thing of like a, a summary of time machine. I said, could you add call outs and stuff about the characters and stuff, you know, um, and you know, it's just just a lot of capabilities. I think we're going to start seeing we're just the early days of how we work on documents. And I think that one thing we're finding out, too, is that like. The thing that makes AI writing special is you, the more you you put into it and yeah. and you, you can kind of tell something that's really good when somebody's done it and then plus it or whatever, like, hey, I'm going to do a thing, but let me have the AI write the call outs or improve my language. And so, yeah, we're in this. Yeah, amazing phase where we're learning how to do it. And I think the end result, when we put a bit of us into it, it turns out being much better. Um, although there was a study that just came out where they used GPT-4 versus uh, doctors, doctors versus GPT-4, and doctors using GPT-4, right? So we had three categories, doing di uh -huh. doing, doing some of like forensic diagnosis or certain kind of diagnosis. So doctors, doctors using GPT-4, and then just GPT-4. Yeah. Who do you think performed worst? Uh, worst, just I would say doctors. GPT four. Doctors. Oops, sorry. Okay, doctors. Who do you think performed uh, best? Oh, doctors. Doctors with, with GPT four. Yeah, that's what we'd like to think, but nope, that wasn't the case. Oh, no. it was really? <laughs> it was. It was doctors GPT four are better than doctors. And and it, and it was to say that uh, Ethan Mollick, who does a lot of great coverage of, uh, uh, he's a professor at Wharton, a lot of great coverage on this, got a lot of pushback. Uh, he he frequently has to sometimes say, hey, I'm removing this post because of this or whatever. And uh, there there is a there is certainly a the 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 AI cynic crowd out there does not like to hear whenever something outperforms or comes close to performing really well, um, mm -hmm. which 
I, I think it's fine to be skeptical and ask for facts and supportive evidence on stuff. But if you're staking your ground that, that we are just magic, that there's some magic quality that AI will never be able to, you know, replicate, I don't think that's solid ground to be on. <laughs> yeah, but the robots can't do this job. <laughs> I'll be safe yeah. forever. Yeah. So uh, Meta announced a new video model, a series of video models. Mm, yeah. And uh, these look, uh, you know, the, the video space is very, very, very interesting in that there's a lot of different, you know, players in this and people trying to build different things. There are still some fundamental challenges with trying to do video, and that is that the same thing that you have to deal with images is trying to get really complex images with a lot of different elements going on at the same time. And, you know, an example I give is, you know, if you can't get an AI to generate a menu reliably, you know, an image generator, you know, a video generator is not going to do a very good close up of a menu or a things with a lot of specifics about it. And that will change over time. That will change. Yeah. So. Uh, I, I mean, that's, that's the other thing is it's, boy, do we love uh, single tense verbs or, or, or thinking in single tense where it's just like, oh, AI is. And it's like, there is no AI is blank. There's AI currently does blank. You know, it's like uh, so many people have made their decisions. If you made your decision about how you feel about AI three months ago, uh, you already have outdated priors. Like you, you need to, you need to revisit it with a fresh set of eyes. Yeah. So this was the post, a preview of the coming problem working with good AI. This is Ethan Molek. Doctors were given cases to diagnose with half getting GPT-4 access to help. The control group got 73% right and GPT-4 group 77%. No big difference. But GPT-4 alone got 92%. The doctors didn't want to listen to the AI. Uh, so uh, the, the reader context note was the figures referenced are diagnostic reasoning scores, not final diagnosis accuracy per supplement table. G before had the correct diagnosis, 66% of cases compared with 62% of the doctors. But this is not a significant difference. I don't know. Which one do you want to diagnose you? <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, and, and I would. Yeah, and it's not even to say a fine-tuned model. That's the thing. It's like, oh, well, it was only 4% better than doctors. The fact that it was in range of doctors is the news. That is the news, that this thing was in range of doctors. Uh, yeah, man. It, uh, uh, there, there, there's, even if it's doctor-like, you know, even if it's a 50%, yeah, even, even if, what's the old joke? What do they call the person who graduated last in medical school? Doctor. Doctor. You know? doctor. Well, I mean, also because it's available for free wherever you are, and you don't have to look into a human's face to talk about a, a potentially embarrassing thing, and therefore you could actually get care earlier than you would otherwise. I mean, knowledge-based professions are something that, are going to have to understand that their product has to change and the best practitioners of it will be able to utilize this technology. But uh, uh, there have been some industries, the medical profession is one of them, that I know that uh, uh, Andrew and I have had long conversations about its uh, shamanistic tendencies that you're just essentially building a series of moats uh, uh, between you and an old wise poobah who's going to take five seconds out of their day to bless you with their knowledge. And if, if I have an opportunity to just ask my, uh, 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 forever patient British assistant, exactly what this thing on my leg would be, as opposed to going through the oftentimes onerous job of, uh, you know, dealing with a doctor's office, Guess what? I'm just going to be more tuned into my health. I'm going to actually be a healthier, better person when it comes to the day in, day out uh, issues with maladies. And when you look at the crisis that we have currently with primary care physicians, there's less of them and people interact with them far less. Uh, and you know, longstanding problems, specifically with men that don't go to doctors, they don't interact with medical professionals for various different reasons. This is like a godsend. And and I, I hope it's a gigantic wake up call to uh, the, the the medical profession. I hope so. Uh, I 
<laughs> oh, go ahead, Andrew. No, 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 please, Brian. Oh, oh no, no, no. I, I, I was just going to double down on your sentiment, Justin. Yeah, I, you know, my wife, we had to go to the emergency room. She's been, you know, you know not a major, but, you know, an issue where they're like, oh, well, to speak to a doctor, it'll take you two weeks. Best thing is just to go to the emergency room. And it wasn't like, you know, she's in, in any immense danger. But when you're told, well, you need to go to the emergency room if you want to actually speak to a person, your medical expert for this, which is frustrating. And, and you know, and again, this is a universal problem globally from private systems to public systems, all this. This is just... And as you know, people get older, the costs go up, whatever. It's just a factor of, you know, with healthcare is one of the fastest increasing expenses in any budget, just gonna be a problem of that. And you know, at the end of it, you know, we come out of it with like, well, maybe do some tests, maybe do this, I don't know. And it was just sort of the shrug. And it was like I when we were getting ready to go, uh, my wife comes in my office and what are you doing? I'm putting my laptop into my bag. Is why are you bringing that? I go, because we're going to the emergency room and it's going to be several hours there yeah. long waiting. You know, you're going to walk in. They're going to see if you're immediately ready to pull over. If you're not, you're going to sit down and you're going to wait and you're going to wait and you're waiting. We were there like six hours. And yeah, at one point they separated us, not because they had to, but because just the nurse, just, you know, the, the practitioner, whatever, just decided that she just wanted fewer people in the other room. And so my wife is sitting there by herself. And this is just, it was a horrible experience, you know, and I asked, yeah. you know, I remember asking a doctor for directions and I got the most could give an F response about like whatever. And I, this guy's probably running or work a very long shift and stress. So I wasn't like angry at him, but I'm like, I just, I want the robots. I want the robots. I just want the robots. And I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced that there is anything that there's any human presence that I need get these things a bunch of sensors, get these things training. When we're GPT-4 is scoring as well as doctors in a lot of systems, we haven't even seen what's happened, by the way. You have the, you know, the O1, which we talked about previously, OpenAI's O1, where basically what it is, it's a system that knows how to think longer, can spend more time thinking about it. We haven't seen any of the data yet on what O1's doing for diagnoses, other than I've heard some anecdotal stuff. Get ready. You're going to find yeah. that it's going to be probably superhuman than most doctors in a lot of diagnoses. And when we start giving it more information and training them, it's going to uh, short circuit the wait. discussion when it's like the ethical dilemma is, OK, how many humans do you want to consign to an early grave because of your pride about the magic of a human doctor? Yeah, well, we'll I, still I, manage I, I, to do I, that. <laughs> I hope that we look at it at, in the era of. Akin to the era of blood humors and, uh, uh, you know, various different hokum. I, I hope yeah. I hope that, that this is how we look at the, the way that we looked at the medical profession. Patreon.com slash weird things is where you need to go if you want to support this show and not the, I don't know. I don't know why we got my, my anti- doctors think but oh no I, i'm always here for it anti-college justin one of my favorite justins anti-doctor <laughs> anti-elitist wizard <laughs> if, if it's hard uh I, 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 I i'm here for uh we haven't gotten to anti-auto mechanic justin but i'm sure he's there somewhere <laughs> <laughs> No, auto mechanics are like they're they're hit or miss. They're like they're either absolute dead-eyed sociopathic con men or like you, the the most friendly uh uh dwarf from Lord of the Rings. Like yeah. like it's just yeah, it's, it's either Gimli or uh uh you know uh, uh, just a total Tom con Bombadil. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, hey, I, I have to uh, I have to roll a little early for this episode. Do we want to get into picks a little bit yes, uh, ahead of schedule? So there's been a lot of conversation about our modern world of streaming television options. And uh, we saw a lot of content come out over the previous five years that obviously came to a screeching halt with the strike. And so now we're looking at Projects that either had started before then or started after then that are learning the lessons of what had happened before. A few of the things that uh, were complaints, and I think rightly, was that uh, these shows, especially in the genre world, were way too expensive that necessitated them being gigantic hits or they were just never going to go anywhere past that. And out and out boring, oftentimes because there was more of a slavish devotion to, you know, certain maybe social justice elements as opposed to ha having the characters be interesting and fun and have conflicts. So I'm here to say, with uh, happiness and joy in my heart, 
that I really enjoy Agatha all along on Disney Plus. That it has been uh, uh, reported that it is the cheapest Marvel show that they have ever done. Hmm. It doesn't look it. It looks great. It looks fun for for what they they had to do. Uh, yeah, this is a story of uh, continuing on from WandaVision, which I loved. Uh, but now uh, Agatha Harkness, who is revealed in that show, now has uh, no powers and has to get them back. That's the story of this uh, this thing. I I thought that the the first two episodes took a little bit uh, uh, to get to get ready, but ultimately it's a female driven show about female relationships as her and her put together coven are watching or walking the, the the witch's road. And the episode that just came out this week was the first one that I'm like, okay. I get it. I get the aesthetic. When it wants to be creepy, it can be creepy, but really the vibe of this is Stevie Nicks witchy. Like, <laughs> imagine, like, Fleetwood Mac, Stevie Nicks kind of crystals witchy, but Catherine Hahn, and I think credible, fun mysteries uh, that they're they're working within the confines of their lesser budget. So instead of The Witch's Road being this super crazy really creative thing each time they have to walk up a, a road of trials so each episode is one of the trials they're using the the convention of each trial being a house that they got to figure out their way out of but it never feels small it always feels like each house through costuming and the way that they shoot it is something that is different and fun and uh, i think that's often been a problem with some of these other very bloated very very expensive shows and Andrew and I have talked about this forever, is that they look cheap. This is a show that didn't spend all that much money, and it looks awesome because of the way that they put it together. So uh, I would uh, I would say Agatha all along. I've enjoyed it. I'm Yeah, I'm curious. I'll be sure I'll try it, because like, I actually like She-Hulk until the horrible last episode. Like, like She-Hulk was fun and had some energy into it, and then it then, and it's like, uh, anybody who hates it, I'm not going to argue with you, I get it, but it was actually more competent than I thought sort of that where I look, I don't even think I could ever get into Acolyte because that just looks like it's, you know, somebody brought up a point on a YouTube video I watched where they said, Acolyte cost almost as much money as Dune too. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is really funny that like, I think this is like the second story that I've seen that Agatha all along is like, it only costs $40 million or something like that. And it's like comparing it to other stuff. So I wonder who's putting that out. I assume that it is other, it is, it is people from the show that just want to say like, hey, look, hey, look, we don't need that much money. We can, we can do it for, for X amount of price well, because some of these have been just so bloated. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it is a, and I'll, yeah, you want to, you want the, when you get the criticism, like, yeah, the fact that when you look at Acolyte was like, like, 20 million per episode or something like yeah. obi-wan kenobi like obi-wan kenobi looked like garbage that show yeah, just looked, looked cheap sucked. like yeah. it was just you know production and, and you kind of wonder i think one of the criticisms we've known from people who work at disney is that disney gets to be so middle manager heavy like so much so much in there that you end up at a point i think that's probably what's happened to a lot of their productions at marvel i think star wars is that the number of execs involved in the salaries that get associated with that is just ballooned so much that you just get very little on screen yeah yeah uh, uh and and you know ultimately a lot of this stuff it's not i mean it's it, it's not rocket science right television is something that like you could you can write it on the page in this episode this thing happens a a conflict a cost wow our characters have changed i wonder how it's going to affect them going forward we're seeing how they bond with each other this is it, it's not you know uh, uh it's not like secret secret knowledge it's just uh uh something that that i think oftentimes gets sucked under the weight of the production itself but uh yeah so far so far so good i think that, that agatha all along is something that has gotten better each episode the first two i was like eh, all right this, by the end of the second episode we're basically into the adventure that we know is going to be the rest of the show and i'm like oh, okay well i don't know if we needed two episodes to get there but we're here and then uh the next one was was good and and this one was I thought like it's like okay it found its it found its vibe the characters you know who the characters are you you have a sense of how real the world is and they're doing things that you're like oh, okay cool I, I'm having fun awesome very cool I've been combing through the meta 
their movie gen, which is the their new video generator, and looking at the paper on that, a lot of details about that. Uh, mm. Yeah, this was announced. Uh, uh, you, I know you mentioned when. When was this announced? Like yesterday. Wow. Uh, the uh, uh, seeing it, it's one thing to hear about it, another thing to look at it. Uh, there are some of these that absolutely pass muster, uh, and there are others that look uh, kind of uncanny valley Pixar-y, where it's like at first it looks good, but then you kind of see some too sharp edges, but it, it's incredible. Um, what? Yeah, one of the cool things in there, Brian, if you look where their people are just, they have ones where you supply your photo, uh -huh. and then it creates a scene based on that. And that's like super interesting because basically the idea that you have the personalized videos where it starts with the photo and then it figures out how to map that person into that environment. Oh, wild. So, so in other words, they've got uh, a, a doctor working in a lab and like, what if that doctor was me? Yep. 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 And is, so it, that, is this available yet? I don't think it's, uh, I think there's a limited, limited beta. Yeah. Like the turn on these things are just so intensive. Yeah. Uh, so. You know, they're but that's I think they're gonna push this thing out there as much as they can, you know. That's really remarkable stuff. Uh now of course they're uh actually you know what they, they do have a few like uh, uh, uh non fantastical examples here. Uh but they're all very pro photographer looking. Yeah. Um but I'm they sure I'm well sure lit. I'm sure that that's not any indication that it won't be able to do uh, totally believable candid stuff. Yeah, the, the challenge is really going to be being able to handle complexity. The idea of of all because you're seeing things that are like a single subject for the most part in a frame, you know, a person doing that. You know, you're not getting a crowd of people or a man, you know, somebody handing an envelope to somebody else and somebody reading it. You know, you're getting very sort of simple sorts of things, and and that's going to be the problem. The kind of compute to make things more complex will be challenging, but not insurmountable. Man, it's just, I mean, again, I know we say this a lot, but it's happening very fast, gentlemen. Yep. Oh, yep. boy. Uh, uh, all right, friends, I have to uh, take my leave. I'll see you later. All right, take care, Adieu. Justin. Bye. Uh, man, I just I just want to gawk at all of these video. Uh, uh, if you just search for meta video AI, I'm sure you'll find. Yeah, movie gen. Uh, yeah, movie, movie gen. gen. Yeah. Uh it's it's worth taking a look at uh it's it's uh, it's unreal well the, and a couple of features are really great like they have a thing where you can take a video input then add a text like they have like if you go back to the one before um the guy like they said put the put the guy in front of a stadium you know and you think for blue screen and a lot of other kinds of things that it's going to be the most directly impactful thing right now is for vfx and stuff where literally you just take your 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 still of your actor and say, okay, your, your video frame, not your video, but your, you know, your, your video of an actor and say, okay, I need to have fire come out of his hands. And yeah. two minutes later you got the effect. Well, and uh, uh, to be honest, like the difference between the original video is you just see a blue sky in the background versus you see a, you know, outdoor stadium with a lot of people. Um, it makes me feel like the big winners are going to be uh, low budget productions that are story driven stuff like uh, for example let's say you're doing a lifetime movie or whatever then what you have to do to get a shot like that happens to be let's say at a high school football game is you have to actually go find a high school football game and then you have to cut to an awkwardly up close shot because you can't obviously fill a whole stadium full of people just for one romantic conversation that they're having uh, but meanwhile adding this out, out of focus blurry in the background is going to be a snap yeah, look at some of the other examples of edit video text. Uh, they have like, there's a guy running in the desert. It, same, yeah, right there. And so original video is guy just running out in the desert. Then they did text input, turn it to a cactus desert. And so now it's a slightly more colorful desert with cacti around them. You know, they said, oh, let's make him into an inflatable dinosaur. So all of a sudden, inflatable dinosaur. And it's just that, that kind of capability. You know, it'll, it's interesting too. Like a lot of these things, you have to kind of look at. And go, what am I not seeing here? You know, what examples are they not showing me? You know, it shows you <laughs> it, where the, the it is funny. Edges. It's like like we've become a little bit cynical over the years when we've seen multiple hype cycles boom and bust. And I feel like both of us are like, what is what is the picture being drawn in the negative space of of every announcement? Yeah.
Yeah, well, it's that's the you know that's the thing that's going on. I think uh, the image space is interesting because like I can tell you, like I I could I would tell you that probably Sora is technically better than this than any other model out there because it's physics capabilities, but. You know, Dolly 3 is technically the best image model out there, but if you really want to have a bunch of different styles and things like that, it's you're going to choose something else. And I think that's, you know, often you kind of realize where people kind of like they, they look at some things and don't notice other things. Yeah. Boy, uh, with fantastical objects, this really sings mainly because my brain doesn't have many references to compare it to. Like we're seeing a uh, uh, looks like a capuchin monkey in a hot spring no monkey. with uh, with a yeah. toy boat. Um, uh, it uh, and it looks real enough to these eyes. Yeah, yeah. I, I we're at the point where a lot of the stuff would go by you would never notice. I wouldn't notice. Yeah, uh, and and the the prompts are, are very detailed. Uh, text input summary: A fluffy koala bear surfs. It has a gray and white coat and a round nose. The surfboard is yellow. The koala bear is holding onto the surfboard with its paws. The koala bear's facial expression is focused. The sun is shining. And uh, dang, if that's not what we're seeing. Um, hey, uh, I'm gonna use one of my slots for a pick to celebrate a uh, uh, one of our previous guests on the Weird Things podcast. And to make sure I get it all right, uh, Annalisa was kind enough to forward along. Do you remember our friend J.F. Dubo uh, when we had him on? Of course. Yeah. Uh, yes. uh, uh, he's one of our exemplars. Uh, we're big fans of independence of all stripes. But J.F. Dubo, uh, here, I, I'm going to plug his book. Um, the that, First of all, the website that everyone needs to go to is Aquillow, A-C-H-E-W-I-L-L-O-W dot com slash book. And the uh, uh, the story, here we go, let me, actually, there we go. Uh, Annalisa writes, uh, friends of the show, Amy Frost and J.F. Dubow are seven seasons into their delicious audio drama, Ake Willow, and it's now time to turn it into a book. Pre-order your copy now at akewillow.com slash book. And if you buy three of them, you get your name in the book, as well as some other treats. They need a, uh, 750 pre-orders by Halloween, um, and are just a smidge over halfway there. So head on over to equilo.com slash book to get them uh, past the finish line. And uh, uh, let me give you a summary on that. But but obviously, uh, you, you know this game, Andrew, where it's like when it comes to pre-ordering, it's like, uh, you, you know, a uh, t- uh, hundred units are a uh, billion dollars. Uh, a, a thousand units are a billion dollars plus one. So it's like you you, you want to get to that quantity on there. I bought mine back in August. Oh, dang it. Okay. Uh, tagline is part Twin Peaks, part practical magic. Ake Willow is a story about coffee, magic, bacon, and, baking, and demons. Join Miriam DeFore as she navigates the quirky and not so quiet town of Ake Willow, where your coffee comes from a steampunk monstrosity with an attitude problem, and the mac- uh, macarons might bite back. Lovesick ghosts and starving demons? Just another Tuesday in Ake Willow. So read all about it at aquillow.com slash book. Yeah, sounds great. Uh, like I said, uh, JF is a great guy, uh, super, uh, super energetic, you know, has been out there, has been really writing some great stuff. And so, yeah, the moment he told me about this, I just went and ordered it. Um, I'm a sucker for my friends. <laughs> um, but uh, my pick is, you know, I've been enjoying is it got a little weird weirder than usual but only murders in the building still a fun show you know what i i I think we talked about this previously but you know i'm watching it for cord killers and i'm just fascinated by the pacing i don't know if i already went on my little rant about it's kind of adorable how slow motion everything is it's clearly the leads are getting up there in years and also the intended audience is getting up there in years so as a result uh i i don't know it's got a lot of heart uh and, and I've been enjoying just dropping in without any context into season four. Yeah, I think uh, it's it's got great talent, quirkiness. You know, when you can get uh, Meryl Streep and Eugene Levy to play side characters on a thing, pretty cool. Yeah, it. Uh, yeah. So uh, uh, I guess we did picks early on. Do, do we have another story that you wanted to cover? Um, you know, I think. Um, 
you know, the movie Jin, go check that out. <laughs> you know, yeah. So. <laughs> wait, wait. <laughs> the uh, it's uh, uh, it's so interesting. It's just I I don't know. Uh, uh, AI so fast. Like just watching the AI show is insane. Yeah. Um. Yeah, we gotta we spend a lot of time talking about and after things about like how to adjust and how to adapt, and it is it is a very fast paced moving world. Uh, and but how's it been for this hour? It's been weird. Beauty. I figure we'll just put a button on that and we'll go right into uh, after things. Yes. Uh, I'm gonna make a note to clean up the. I left awkward silences so that I could easily find those spots to clean up in the in the audio. X and things. After things. Uh, <laughs> I, you and I both usually sneak off to the bathroom here. You want me to just put on some music for a second? Yeah, if, you, if, the, if the chance is there, then I'll do it. Okay, all right. <laughs> like here, we'll just do... <laughs> there we go. All right, we'll be right back. <laughs> Wait for it. Wait for it. Wait for it. Where is it? Oh, no. Oh, there we go. Oof, thank goodness. Slide that phone to my phone. Ah, oh, doggone it. How long has it been quiet? <laughs> oh, the Hippo AI video. I totally should have done that. Here, it's not too late. Actually, it is too late. He's back. Hmm. All right. Uh, oh, yeah. I, got, I got a pretty good topic for after things, if you like. Go for it. Okay. All right, well, here, you, you want to bring us in? In three, two. Hello, and welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Howdy, howdy. Yo. <laughs> okay, I actually, uh, uh, I, got a, I got a good story for you. One week ago today, we were doing this very program, and I had a problem, and I think... I think I might have, for the millionth time, said some version of the, you know, the when to start problem because, uh, you know, I want a very efficient pipeline to get content out, something that hopefully I could go in minutes from concept to execution on. And so uh, the very next morning, on Saturday morning, so this is less than one week ago, I woke up and... Uh, uh, and checked to see whether or not the local iPhone store had an iPhone Pro Max 16, and they did. And I didn't care what color it was, so I got the goofy brown one. Uh, and I, uh, I I started playing with it. I played with the uh, the cinematic mode on the photography. Played with the audio uh, mixer, which I believe one week ago you told me about. And all of a sudden, I was thinking, man, the idea of being able to 
record quality audio without having to do a cardioid mic, you know, even if it was just here and again, like that's fast, fast, fast. So then later that day, it's like, okay, let me figure out a pipeline. So I learned how to do a bunch of stuff in Adobe Rush because I knew Adobe uh, uh, Premiere Pro. And uh, allegedly there was a cloud connection between the two so I could start a video on the phone and finish it on the desktop. Turns out they discontinued that feature, so I wasted a few hours on that. But uh, I just pivoted. I talked to ChatGPT, said, hey, what, what does everyone use? What's the benefit and detriments to each? I tried another, I chased another dead thread <clears throat> with a product that didn't do what it said it was going to do and ended up with CapCut, which is from the TikTok folks, ByteDance. And turns out they do have a system that works. Uh, so you can record straight to an iPhone with pretty good noise removal on the audio, and you can finish it on the desktop, and then you can publish instantly. So the next day, I created my first short. Uh, it, it looks, uh, as a matter of fact, here, let me, let me I'll put so it on the screen for you. And... Um, uh, I originally did not even intend to publish it, but it was one of those things where it's like, look, I got to learn this in anyway. Um, and it ended up being good enough that I felt okay about putting it out. It doesn't have music though. Uh, but I just did weird facts about LA. Los Angeles sits atop the third largest oil field in the entire United States. They used to have oil derricks. Success! Oh, there we go. Five interesting things about L.A. Los Angeles sits atop the third largest oil field in the entire United States. They used to have oil derricks all over the place, then they got embarrassed, and now they hide them in fake buildings. Everything from fake bell towers to fancy whatever these are. Los Angeles County is bigger than the entire state of Rhode Island. Reno, Nevada is 100 miles west of Los Angeles. So anyway, Angeles uh, uh, all of this is uh, perfectly serviceable YouTube shorts looking material. And uh, then the next day, I, uh, I I just decided that I was going to try to make a, uh, a video every single day. So the next day, I had something a little bit better, just a one-note uh, gag that you could do to mess with your friends. Um, uh, basically, you challenge people to... Uh, come up with words that don't have a certain set of letters, and then you show that uh, basically all of the uh, uh, spelled out numbers from w one to a million fit the category. So, like, they're thinking of individual numbers. And anyway, uh, but this one right here, I did an episode. So, so this is not even using the cinema mode. It turns out you can calculate pi by chucking sticks at a table. Challenge goes like this. You got a table with a bunch of lines going across and you've got sticks, each one cut to be exactly the length in between each of these lines. The proposition is simple, 20 trials and you need to guess which is gonna happen more. Are they gonna land in this no man's land, not touching a line, or are they gonna land such that they cross one of those lines? Lock in your bet right now. As you drop these, you're gonna notice almost two out of three times they're gonna end up crossing instead of non-crossing. This struck me as totally counterintuitive, but then I was even more amazed because the exact ratio isn't two out of three times that it's gonna cross. The actual ratio is two out of pi, which means that with enough trials, you can calculate pi to an infinite number of digits. Luckily, computers do that, and the results turn out to be correct. The more times you iterate, the more precise the number gets. So yes, it turns out, you can calculate pi. So I even was able to do one of those looping videos. Um, same yeah. thing. So, okay, here's the challenge. So, so uh, all, uh, the, the button on it is uh, a few days later, this this pi video is uh, turns out to be a runaway. It's, it's creeping up on 100,000 views by the end of today. And uh, one week ago, I didn't even own... I didn't own any of the software. I didn't know how to do any of the production on it. I didn't know all of the best practices, but just any time I got frustrated hunting for a button or uh, I, I would ask for help to find it, but but you you know you learn to very quickly chat with chat GPT and and say, "I'm in this environment. I need blank." End of sentence, and then it just tells you. Uh, it, it picks the shortest, plots the shortest path to you. And uh, it, it's been an extraordinary week. Like, 
between, uh, and of course, this is going to end up being cumulative as I keep doing a short a day, which could take anywhere from, you know, an hour to two hours of my time. But if each one is a trickle, it's going to end up being a torrent, like in one week, generating a quarter million views just in the YouTube environment alone has been bonkers. So how long does it take you to generate? Uh, well, it depends on the uh like for example this video okay. that is oh sorry we got audio yeah. happening um okay the it video that is uh one one of the videos turned out to be let me switch this over turned out to be just all in one take like i didn't have to do any editing or jump cuts i went into a pitch black studio and lit i, I had to practice like four times to get it all in one take, but this is like a 40 second thing. Uh, audio listeners, it's uh, just picture, everything's black, I light a match and I'm talking by match light. And then, uh, and then, there we go, let me turn this way down because it's gonna bark at us. Uh, and then it goes to black and then comes back again. Yo, check this out. A single match burns at 600 to 800 degrees Celsius. That's over a thousand degrees Fahrenheit. In about two to three seconds, that flame can cook your flesh. It can cause a second degree burn. Hold it 10 seconds and you're gonna have white charred flesh and be scarred for life. But if you're a fire eater and you're a professional and you must not try this at home, you can inhale very, very slowly, dissipating all of that heat inside your mouth and create a human jack-o'-lantern. And then all you see is uh, the grinning jack-o'-lantern face and then it goes to black with Happy blow it out. Yo, check this out. But uh, uh, it's been it's been incredible to see the turnaround. Oh, and I guess the real cherry on top is yesterday, last night, YouTube announced that they're expanding shorts from one minute long to up to three minutes long. Three. And at one at one minute, there's no way for me to get an integrated sponsor. But at three minutes, we could take twenty seconds to talk about how great Squarespace is. <laughs> so so from end to end i'm sorry so from end to end from creation to final product what was your total time uh i'd say the shortest is under an hour um and uh the longest has been i don't know three hours interesting interesting so what is your biggest time consumption there uh oh the uh right now i'm grabbing all of the interesting facts that i've learned for the last 25 years so it's like it's the well polished material or it's just a it's just a one off joke like for example this one starts off looking like one of those logic puzzles but has a funny ending and all i'm doing is uh reading an email from one of the fans that sent it in um Okay. You'll probably like this. Brian, Cindy, D, and Alex each brought an item to a gift exchange. There's a bag of trail mix, a loaf of oh. bread, a bag of roasted nuts, and a box of caramel popcorn. They exchanged a whole bunch of times, and nobody goes home with the same item they originally brought. Brian traded his caramel popcorn with Cindy. Alex received the banana bread, but it did not come directly from D. Later, Cindy swapped her item with the person who originally brought the trail mix. Finally, Brian and Alex made an exchange. Cindy did not end up with the banana bread and Dee did not end up with the trail mix. So the question is, what did Brian end up with? And the answer is Dee's nuts. Okay, here we go. <laughs> so, Brian... so that's quite literally, I, I pressed print on the email. I walked out and set up the shot. There, there was a little bit of figuring out because uh, I was a noisy environment. I had to wear a transmitter uh, and, and learn to sync audio. But, but now that I know that, that would be maybe a 15 to 30 minute turnaround uh, for, for decent quality. And, and that one looks like it's going to cross over 10,000 today. Very cool. Very, very cool. Uh, um, yeah, uh, Annalise is asking if the three hours is from idea to finished product. Yes. Yeah, that is that is from me at 6 in the morning, 6.30 in the morning, having an idea, and then sitting down to record at 9 and having everything done by 11, 11.30. Yeah, I think one of the things, you know, we've talked about is that you know, we just talked about earlier and weird things about uh, Movie Gen, which is the Meta's new video generation platform and a lot of that. But, uh, you know, I, I 
I think that we're going to be in an economy where we're going to have AI stuff. We're going to still want people, but I think we're going to be tolerant of a lot of AI production helping that. Because like, you, we're at the point now where you could have recorded that in front of your computer, you know, in your dirty T-shirt and your hair messed up, whatever, and get your audio and get your, you know, your your you. Then just have an AI create a version of that, put you in the background, straighten your hair, and do that. And you could get it kind of in your first take, you know, and be up and running in minutes. Well, and and there is a proto version of that, you know, in beta within CapCut with like uh, AI use and stuff. Um, uh, right now, uh, I'm intentionally leaning into uh, 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 concrete assets because I worry about how stuff will age. You know, uh, AI has a look that's very of this moment that looks amazing and impressive today, but may or may not look that way months or years from now. And also, if it's content that is time sensitive, then yeah, by all means, I, I guess what I would do is I would set up different voices. Like uh, for people on the email list, they could tell when Thoughtful Brian is writing an essay and when uh, cartoon salesman Brian is is telling some jokes and, and showing off the latest cool thing. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think, yeah, you just said you know it is a it's a moving you know goalpost, and I think these things are going to get better. But um, it's exciting times, and I think there's just a lot we can do to think about how we can make the most of our content. You know, I was thinking of this today about like just getting every weird things episode ever and saying, oh, let's create an episode just about goblins and literally compile all of our stuff there into a narrative. You know, about you know goblins part one, goblins part two, and then when we found out what goblins really were. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, that 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 altered the landscape significantly. Turns out context matters. Yes, yes, yes. Well, and, and that's uh, actually yeah. something that's part of the reason I've not used many of the easy button things is because other people can tell if you press the easy button. And, you know, like like Justin, you know, says uh, the Internet smells effort. And so that's part of why. I, I would rather do multiple takes and get that, that jack-o'-lantern match thing clearly all in one take, uh, very unlikely to have been faked um, or, or easy buttoned. Whereas, whereas yeah. This, yeah, no, I agree. this other one, it, it could be a be, uh, an easy button thing because the real star of the show is the joke email that someone sent. And it's like, I didn't want to take time to say the words, so-and-so sent me an email. So instead by yeah. having the prop in the first three seconds, you get the fact that, oh, Brian's reading something. This must be something he just received. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot. It's, it's a, there's a, the guy that does uh, what pitch meeting, um, Ryan, what's his name? Um, he does sometimes some breakdowns. He watches like showing the evolution over the years of how pitch meetings evolved. And you, you look at the modern oh, yeah, ones. Yeah, where yeah, you yeah. Do this, where he, he plays both characters. Yeah, Ryan, yeah. Yeah. Ryan George. Yeah. And the early ones, the, the pacing is just very, very, and I, and I get, and he shows now the pacing is just the, where the jokes go, it just lands. First ones were really good. They built the following and you would, you, and it's, it's one of those things. It's, it's neat to watch him analyze that because if you tried to say what's wrong with the first ones, you know, you, you, your tightness was a thing, but it doesn't, was an obvious tightness, but 400 milliseconds here, 400 milliseconds there. And it really adds up. Well, and it's as though you tell the joke twice. Like I agonized over uh, how many frames to wait for the pause for the, you know, the D's nuts ending of that, of that gag. And even that, I, I put a button on top of me mugging for the camera because everything kind of has a visual subtext to it. So it's like it's clear that by the end, uh, you know, there's kind of a ain't I a stinker button at the end, but I didn't have to say or do anything on there. Yeah, man, that's that's secrets of comedy, folks. <laughs> yeah. comedy. comedy is about to become an exact science. Uh, I, I, yeah. I, I bet there are AI comedy bots coming down the pipeline. Yeah, uh, comedians and people love to tell you AI can't do comedy, but when you empirically test, like, you know, certain kinds of joke generation and things like that, you find out, uh, actually, it can. 
and that which is you know disconcerting to people which i understand and there, there's more complex forms of stuff etc and it also depends a lot on character is that you know Stephen wright saying Stephen wright jokes is hilarious but you know joe from accounting getting up on stage to go do it sometimes not as funny just you know and it, it, there is delivery matters a lot but yeah um, well and uh um, that's also part of you know uh, we got to the micro with like individual microseconds for comedy type timing. If we go out to the macro, that's part of why I'm really enjoying just running around and it's clearly me with the camera, but because it's clearly just me with the camera, uh, it's, it's interesting to see people who had forgotten about scam school, scam nation. And now all of a sudden it's in the feed and very clearly, you know, there's effort being put into it. The, the response has been warm. That's that's awesome. I just lost my window, Brian. Where are you? Oh, oh, oh there I, you I, are. I, okay, Sorry. I was about to say. I, uh, <laughs> so my productivity hack, which I will share, is I've been dealing with you know as you you start to have to deal with a lot more information and stuff in front of you. Let me just try to take a picture of this setup here. Um, I have found that uh, as much as I, you know, much as the vision of wearing an Apple Vision Pro, you know, uh, several days a week uh, or, you know, nonstop would seem like a cool idea. This has been my solution. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's great. So you got you got one uh, vertical portrait mode window to your left. Yeah. And then the the big ass monitor to the right. Yeah. So. The when I'm working on a thing like the 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 vertical monitor, I can put my my notion, my task list, can keep that there. Or if I'm watching a YouTube video right now, I'm talking to you with the video right there and there. And so it's just it's just been a very helpful thing. And I have my camera right in the middle. So that monitor, it's a monitor that goes vertical. It's like a hundred bucks. God, I can't that that's been the other thing is as because I'm designing a new workflow, uh uh, you know, if we take out the purchase of a new iPhone, which wasn't strictly speaking necessary, but but that audio mix uh, seemed to be a value. Uh, I think I've spent, you know, I don't know, uh, 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 under five hundred dollars on everything, and that's just buying everything. The moment I realize, like, I need to do a blank. Hey, Chat GPT, what's the best way? Of, uh, for example, I bought the Topaz. Um, video upscaler because I, I found some old, I found the original footage of that knife trick and uh, uh, it's it's already four times the quality of any version of it that's, that's out there because uh, the one everyone has seen is super low quality and I've not been able to find the original until three days ago and so I don't even know how I'm going to release that, but uh, I do know that I want to try upscaling it even more. So anyway, uh, it's amazing how cheap things are as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, it's a it's funny because, like, you watch remember the Apple announcement, like, oh, adding extra screens and stuff. And then it's like, yeah, like, I agree. We're going to keep adding more screens in our future. But there's something about just add one more screen here. And that becomes sort of my task, my clipboard instead of so my virtual clipboard or whatever I'm working on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, physical real estate of visual information. I, I, I get this sense. I mean, I don't know. There's, there's probably not much of a way to quantify it just yet, but I'd be curious, like how fundamentally changed, uh, uh, let's say, you know, uh, Americans of our age have become over the last 40 years, like, uh, just the, as the media landscape gets faster and faster and the information processing and the expectation of immediate, like, yeah, skip to the thing that I want. Uh, I don't know. Like, I wonder, like, you remember that was the conceit of the pilot episode of Max Headroom in the 80s was that so they had something called blipverts, which were advertisements that ran so fast they caused literal bodies to explode like humans can't handle it. That's uh, the blipverts look exactly like <laughs> common videos on YouTube now. Yeah, I was uh, Max Max Hedder was such a cool show. Um, I, I was a fascinated. A friend and I went watched in high school, and we were fixated on the whole idea of like a fast food vending machine. 
the idea that I could go to a vending machine and get like a McDonald's burger or fries. And we thought we tried to think of like how to do a fast food, a vending machine that could do French fries. Yeah. Because that was just just we thought that would be the coolest thing in the world. Your your high school, of course, you know, you know, this is this is what you think about. Um, because it's just I don't know. That that Max Headroom is such a very, very cool show. Uh very, very yeah, cool. and in prescient in certain ways and uh uh yeah, it was great. I uh right now I'm gonna try something where I wanna take the uh um trying to take I have a a document and I want to kind of go into uh GPT oh one because it's one of these things where you think about something that can process things longer and what what happens when you have those capabilities. You know, it's a very interesting paradigm when you get into to think about this because part of what we're talking about like trying to figure out like uh planning or how you account for stuff, you know, like business plans, whatever, like what do you think about that? And that's one of the things that to encourage people to do is Use a model, you know, whether it's Claude or it's OpenAI's models. And if you try like O1, more clever one, and say, help me write a business plan, help me write a strategy. This is the resources I have now. Really, really, really good at that. Really, really good. And you can give it constraints and stuff. Uh, right on, man. Uh, uh, do, you have any, do you have any productivity picks? Um, you know, I don't want to sound like a robot, but I've been having, you know, Notion has been very helpful for me for doing task lists and linking things together and connecting stuff. Is is um, there something new that you discovered about Notion? Well, the AI part of Notion, the AI component within Notion is really good because if you put all of your documents in there and you want to search for something, the AI component just makes it so much easier to find stuff. And, you know, as I try to get organized and plan things, having a uh, a center place of record is just like super critical. You know, where do I put this now? And so now I'm just trying to, you know, kind of funnel things into it. I've been hesitant before, but now I've just found it very useful to sort of, you know, use Notion as my workspace. That's great. Uh, I guess, I guess I'll, I'll, I, I, I just say cap cut, man. Like if you, if you just need a quick and dirty editing suite, uh, it, it, it's got like, again, like the pro is, I think a hundred bucks or something. And it has, you just don't have to worry about anything. <laughs> like you're like, I need music. And you just type the type of music and all of a sudden you got a bunch of choices and they're all pre-licensed and all that stuff. Yeah. It's, uh, I'm trying to pull down some research stuff because I want to do a little more dive into it. And like, it's just how much stuff gets locked behind these stupid paywalls and these stupid, you know, like, you know, academic research of all places. You know, it's just one of these things that's just frustrating to think about, like, you know, the, the, the how, bastion. How much knowledge of where, is, is gatekept or? Yeah, because you're like, you know, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> this is sounding like a bigger discussion than we have time for. Yeah. And I, you know, I found it somewhere else, but anyhow, I'm just, I'm asking, I want chat GPT to like, Hey, uh, can you make a exec summary of this? There was a research study done by U UCLA about um, how much you lose or actually how much you retain when you listen to things at faster speeds. Mm -hmm. And surprisingly, um, there's points at which, and the thing is, it's like the, the single best study ever done on like listening to things at, at higher speeds, right? Problem is it leaves a lot out about the cadence, the speakers, all these other questions you have about that. And, you know, so you're left with kind of going, uh, you know, okay, this is one of the, this could be one of the most important things about learning technology right now is the idea of speeding up media, but there's just no data. There's not a lot of data on it. So I'm going to give you uh, the study learning in time, double the effect, learning in double time, the effect of learned lecture video speed on immediate and delayed comprehension and key findings playback speed up to two X does not impair comprehensions. Participants watch lectures at speeds of one X, 1.5, two X, 2.5 X. Comprehension tests showed minimal difference in immediate and delayed understanding when videos were viewed at speeds up to 2x. Performance significantly declined when videos were played at 2.5 speed. Rewatching increased speeds increases performance when timed before assessments. So they did things where they had people watch things again and whatnot. Uh, ordering a viewing speeds didn't affect things. So 
you know, it was a very neat study to sort of look at, like, if you speed things up, does it help? Yeah, I think I think we had talked about this study previously, um, and, uh, man, I'm a big believer. There's a reason that I take multiple laps on books that are impactful because I want to cement, you know, exactly what they say, and I'd rather listen to a book. I, I, I don't do 2X. I comfortably do, like, just one and a quarter, uh, but I, I think I told you before that Tom Merritt is a monster who does 3X. Yeah, I it to me it's variable. And if I creep it up, I can do I, I would say my drop off at 3x is really high. And I, I'm curious to talk to some 3x people to find out what the retention rate is. Because for some people it's kind of a comfortable background noise. It also just really depends upon the material, you know. And you know, I was gonna I was joking about building a uh an app that was gonna be like, you know, for doing speed listening and it was gonna have like three speeds. Slowest speed would be Lex Friedman, medium speed with Joe Rogan, high speed would be Ben Shapiro. <laughs> uh, I, I would imagine that there's an even like a, an infrared style, super slow speed uh, featuring Sam Harris. Yes. Yeah, well, I mean, Lex is pretty, pretty. <laughs> have, you, have you had a chance yet to play with Notebook LM? Uh, yes, uh, as a matter of fact, the uh, I, I got fooled for almost a minute long with the like uh, 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 Tom Merritt took our cord killers episode last week and fed it into Notebook LM and uh, he selected the uh, podcast summary so it's a male and female host and uh, they they've got enough of the verbal ticks that I totally it took me I don't know nearly a minute before I'm like. Wait a minute. Here, let me see if I can find it for you. But but uh, for those who don't know, uh, how, how do you describe Notebook LM? So basically, it's a project by Google, an experimental project where you can throw a bunch of different notes and documents inside of there and then ask questions and search through it. And it's been out for a year. And then they added a thing that was pretty cool where they just put in this ability to create a podcast. Like Brian said, it's called like Deep Dive, and it's basically just an AI host. And it's a great way to summarize stuff. I, I put my Wikipedia in there, and it is like the most flattering thing in the world. And people are doing things like with their LinkedIn, take their LinkedIn and put it in there. And, you know, you get this big ego boot because it is strange. It is. I can explain everything on a technical level. I've been playing with voice models forever. When you put them all together, it is really weird. Very, very weird effect. Uh, all right. Here we go. This is uh, this is uh, them talking about uh, whatever. There is no day. name. So we're diving into this whole thing with movie theaters, you know, trying to like stay afloat in the age of streaming and all that. And get this, they might be turning to get this pickleball to save yeah. themselves. Pickleball. Yeah, it sounds kind of crazy, right? But actually, when you really dig into what the cord killers folks were saying in their last episode, it's not as out there as it sounds. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, we all <laughs> anyway, they, it, it was only the fact that they kept referring to us as the cord killers guys like seven times that I'm like, wait a minute. Yeah, it's uh, I put in a bio, my dad, I got my dad to write about his life story, which is amazing. And I put that in there and it was interesting listening to it talk about it. Um, you know, uh, incredible. That's cool. Every day. Every day is Christmas now with AI. It really is, man. Uh, uh, all right. Speaking of which, I got I to gotta finish a, a YouTube short. All right. It's been after. Boop, boop. We did it. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's interesting on the shorts. It's like there's sort of a meta narrative that I'm doing where I'm. Well, I don't know. I'll, 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 let me get more out, and I'll explain what I'm doing. We'll see if I okay. if it works. <laughs> but uh, all right, well, cool. I, uh, uh, hey, everybody who watched live, thank you guys so much for joining us. Sorry that we started a little bit late. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> all right, here I'm gonna drop the stream. Bye, guys. <laughs>